So our theme for these Sundays prior to Lent is rooted. We are talking about the different core values that we hold as a church and how that keeps us rooted in our faith and in our daily living. So last week, Dylan, our pastoral resident, preached on the first portion of this story from Luke chapter 4 and talked about being rooted in sacred purpose. And it was an excellent, wonderful sermon. He talked about Jesus being in the synagogue in Nazareth. You remember they handed Jesus a scroll. Jesus opened the scroll and read a portion of text from the book of Isaiah that said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm going to preach good news to the captives, bring sight to the blind, make the lame walk. I'm going to free those who are oppressed. And today this is fulfilled in your hearing. And all the people who were in the synagogue said, Amen. Messiah is finally here. Our people, our people are finally going to be able to see and be able to walk and be able to be set free from what oppresses them. That was the good news, and that's where Dylan stopped last week. Uh, because that is good news. It was a good sermon about our sacred purpose of healing and giving freedom. And then Dylan saved the second half of the story for me. Here's how the second half of the story goes. Jesus continues. They said, amen, we're glad Messiah is here. Finally, our people, our people will experience some sight and some movement and some freedom in this world. And Jesus said, well, yeah, but... You know, there were a lot of widows in Israel during the time of Elijah who were needy, but Elijah actually went to a Gentile widow of Zarephath and helped her. And there were a lot of lepers in Israel who were needy during the time of Elisha, but Elisha actually went to Syria and helped a Syrian leper named Naaman. So, yeah, I'm here to help you, but not just you. To which the people said, wait. You're not our Messiah alone. You're actually going to help the world and not just us. And so they took him to a cliff and tried to throw him over. That's the Jim Dant paraphrase version, by the way, the whole thing. I was in a deacon's meeting in a former church. You get the connection, throwing the pastor over the cliff and being in a deacon's meeting in a former church, right? Are you making the connection? Our personnel had committee had given their report. They had mentioned that one of our associate ministers had been in Nashville leading a conference there uh, over the last week. Uh, at the end of the report, I went back to the podium and they said, said are there any questions? And uh, one of the deacons raised his hand and said, why in the world is our associate minister in Nashville leading a conference? And I said, well, it's an outreach conference and that's a part of his skill set. And so he's sharing that with other churches that are there. Well, why shouldn't he be here working? I said, well, we kind of hold a world view here at the church, and so we share our skill sets with the world, and we want to put our church on the map, and we want to know people to know who we are so that when they visit our town or are looking for a church, they come to our church. I said, does that make sense? He said, no. <laughs> we don't pay you all to work in the world. We pay you to work here. Thankfully, the rest of the deacons didn't agree. I think it's the biggest challenge for ministers. One of the biggest challenges in our work is to keep the church healthy and happy, that's you, and at the same time engage the world and try to get the world engaged with the church. That's the other 80 to 90 percent of the population in Greenville County. That ought to shock you a little bit. You realize that only 80% at best, but usually 90% of Greenville County is in a church on a Sunday morning. 80 to 90, I mean 20% is in, 10%. 80 to 90% of the, of the population of this county is outside of church on Sunday morning. Got that backwards. Only 10 to 20% are in any worshiping facility this morning. It's tough to get the world engaged with the church. So loving church and loving the world. We, we should love the church. In Luke's Gospel, in Luke chapter 4, this is the first recorded visit of Jesus to a synagogue. Luke also went on to say, as Sarah read a moment ago, that this was Jesus' custom to go to synagogue. I believe that Jesus loved everything that happened in synagogue. Loved the gathering of his faith community. Loved reading the scriptures and saying the prayers. Loved having those hard discussions over issues. Loved seeing the education of children. I told you two weeks ago, do you remember? I love the church. 
no one loves the church more than me. I am the greatest lover of the church in the world. You remember that, don't you? I love what goes on at church. I love gathering with you on Sunday morning, and really, your presence is a gift to me. It uplifts me when I see you. I love dedicating babies like Jency and Juniper. That is a highlight of worship for me. I love the hard discussions that we share. I love baptisms. I love sharing communion. The list could go on and on and on. I always think about a friend when I think about love for the church. She said to me once, if it were proved absolutely that God did not exist. I mean, like this week, if an article came out in the New York Times that it had been absolutely proven that God did not exist, no question. She said, I would still have to go to church on Sunday morning and talk to my Sunday school class about it. That's how much she loved church. So I don't want to be too hard on these people who were attending synagogue in Nazareth. They loved each other, and they loved synagogue. I get it. But we need to love the world. So Jesus tells the people in Nazareth, I know you love each other. I know you love people who are just like you. But Elijah, when there were all those widows in Israel that needed to take care of, be taken care of, he went to Zarephath to care for a Gentile. Elisha, when there were all those lepers that needed to be healed, healed in Israel, Elisha, one of your great prophets, actually went to Syria and took care of Naaman. It's not just about loving you and keeping you happy and healthy and tended. Messiah needs to engage the world. I shared this on a Wednesday night a couple of years ago. As, as a young seminary student, I interviewed for a pastorate in Indiana. Uh, when I was there meeting with the search committee, the committee was obviously frustrated. They, they were reflecting the frustration of their church as they talked to me. There had been no new members in the church in several years. The church was completely plateaued and somewhat declining. And the question for me was, now what would you do to change that? And my question back was, well, what do people do in town who don't go to church? And immediately one of the committee members said, with a lot of anger and frustration in his voice, I'll tell you what they do, they play pool at the pool hall across the street. It's right across the street from the church. That place packed on Sunday mornings while we've got only a few people here. I said, well, here's what I'd do. I'd learn how to play pool. They didn't hire me. <laughs> we call that taking you to the cliff. They took me over to the cliff. Hey, thanks for hiring me. <laughs> thanks for loving me or tolerating me or something in between. I'm not sure what. Thanks for not taking me to the cliff. I know sometimes you may feel like you've been pushed to an edge and every once in a while kind of challenged beyond your growing edge to love a Syrian or a widow or others who have been overlooked or looked at with less compassion than they should. But I just need to share with you, it's the minister's greatest challenge to somehow care for you and tend you and keep you healthy and happy and at the same time care for and love a world that may not be comfortable for all of us. And so I love that Becky Ramsey goes to hockey games and screams and yells and throws things. Okay, I made up that last part. But she goes to hockey games with our children and our children's friends and family and engages a world outside the walls. I love that I look on Facebook every once in a while and see that Mary Carroll is about town. She has one of these programs where she'll just show up at Panera or show up at a coffee shop and post that I'm going to be there from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock this Thursday. Come sit with me. And young people and their friends come and sit with our youth minister outside these walls. I'm happy that our staff ministers and many members of this church serve on boards and organizations and institutions in this town that our ministers speak and lead conferences and teach outside of this church in this state and across this nation. I love that we support and recognize this morning our foundation partners. I need to say to you again, your work in the world is a gift to the world, but allowing us to partner with you, that is a gift to us. Thank you.
I love that our foundation helps to fund mission teams who travel, one that we'll be commissioning this morning to go to Cuba. It's important that we love and care for each other. That's church. But if we at the same time don't hold the widow of Zarephath and the leper in Syria, we haven't been everything that Messiah came to help us be. A dad had finally gotten home from work. His three children ran and was grabbing him around the legs and the knees. They were ready to play with daddy who had gotten home from work. Dad just needed to unwind, relax, read the paper for a minute, but the kids were eager, the children were persistent, and finally he saw in the back of the newspaper a picture of the world from space, just this black and white picture of the globe all in gray. And so he ripped off the back of the newspaper, he tore the, the world into as many pieces as he could get it into, and he threw it on the floor in front of the kids, and he said, I'll tell you what, when you get the world all put back together, then Dad will play with you, okay? And he thought, that's going to buy me at least an hour. And in just a few moments, they had the whole world completely taped together. The dad was absolutely amazed, and he said, how in the world did you get that grayish, whitish, blackish? You could, there's no way to even figure out, how in the world did you get all of that pieced back together so fast? To which his oldest little daughter said, well, there were people on the back of the page, so we just turned it all over and put the people together. <laughs> and when we flipped it over, the world was fixed. What we decided to do was just put the people together. And when we got the people put back together, the world was fixed. This is not about loving the world as some general idea of world out there. That's way too comfortable and can be forgotten too quickly. This is about the widow of Zarephath. This is about a Syrian named Naaman. This is about Eddie in Cuba. This is about a foster child named Molly. This is about an academic intern named Sarah. This is a choral scholar named Bergsvang. This is loving people and giving people the chance to be all that God has intended for them to be. And in the process, the world gets fixed. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for this place and this space that is sacred to us. For the people who sit with us Sunday after Sunday who are brothers and sisters and friends to us. And Father, we thank you that you have also called us to love the widow of Zarephath and Naaman and all of the other people who need your love and our friendship so that a world can be fixed. Keep us faithful. Keep us rooted in the world because it's a world that you love. We pray these things in Christ's name, but for our sakes. Amen.